Welcome to Conversations on Leadership with Dr. Dave here on KLDR Online Leadership Development Radio. Today, we are pleased to announce our special guest is Diane Bagino, uh, and I'm going to get you to go ahead and start and give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself and your business, um, to our listeners, and just a bit about your background. So welcome, yeah. Diane. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dave. I'm happy to see you again. I like to tell people I started my career on stage. And mm. I learned a lot about people because of the characters I had to analyze. And then I got into HR. And HR and show business are a lot alike because you're always on, I like to say. So I started my own business about 17 years ago. And uh, you and I do something similar, human development and you get people to really know themselves so that they can realize their full potential. And I really enjoy it. We work with assessments and we do team building and I help people build better careers because if you don't help people build a better career before they get to that executive suite, it's too late. <laughs> Amen to that. Good deal, good deal. So what? Uh, it, it's funny you said that. I want to piggyback on something you said. You're like, HR and the stage, HR and theater, HR and acting are, are a lot alike. So get, and I know I get the fact that you're always on. So I, I, I certainly understand and sympathize with that. But, but go a little bit deeper into that. that I think that's got some uh, depth to it that uh, you might have skimmed over just a bit. Well, whenever I had a play to do, you, of course, play a character. You really, or I did at least, really delved into that character. I would write pages and pages and pages about this character. And that's what started getting me fascinated about the human behavior and about how people think and act and why they do the things they do. You know, why are they motivated to do certain things? It's the same thing in HR. If you don't understand people and why they do things and if they're a good fit for a job or not, you're in for a disaster. I would definitely agree with that, especially with the, the good fit for the job. That is, uh, I've yes. seen a whole lot where there's an executive leadership position that um, you're like, wait a minute, six, nine months down the road, or maybe even three months down the road, you realize that this is not the person we need for this job. But then what ends up happening is with an executive leadership position, like, yeah, but you know what? For anybody, a director and above, we're, about, we're gonna give them two years, right? We're just gonna give them two years. So those poor guys, working underneath them with the managers, the supervisors, the staff, you know, even the directors, if it's a VP, oh, we give all of our leadership, you know, two years. You realize six months in, this this cat ain't cutting it, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, now, the, those, now you're just shooting your employee engagement scores in the foot because now I'm going to have to deal with 18 months of this guy. So he hits his two-year mark before they start critically looking at him and saying, or her saying, okay, now, yes, they've been underperforming for two years. We've given them a chance. Maybe we'll. Yeah. A, yeah. Lot, of t a lot of times, though, people will, um, they, put, they promote people because they're doing a good job. So they make them a manager, but it doesn't make them a manager because they're doing a good job. And it certainly doesn't make them a leader. So they set them up for failure. They've got to give them the training. They've got to help them learn the things they need to learn in order to be a leader. Absolutely. I, I talk about in uh, one of the presentations about building a leadership culture is the fact that I, it's, and I love what you're talking about, that, yeah, it's the stereotypical, we take our best salesperson and make them the sales manager, right? Right. And then exactly. it's like, oh, for God's sake, come on. And then they, they don't want to be in that position and mm -hmm. they go back to try to do what they do best with selling, but they need to be out managing the salespeople, right. you know? And so one of the things is, Obviously, you talked about giving them the training to do it. You've got it. I mean, it's a whole new skill set. Absolutely. And and honestly, you talk about from people you know, beat up on the manager, you know, manager versus leader. But honestly, management, and I think it was um, back in the day, you know, industrial, you know, early 1900s or whatever, um, I'm, the exact researcher who coined this uh, slips my mind, although I... Guarantee I have it in one of those books back there. Guarantee. Yeah, you know, they, they they talked about the management skill set was like positive corp. You know, it was, it was you know, planning and organizing and developing and budgeting and, and all these types of things. And you could be a great leader. Like I can see the vision and I can get the vision across to people and you'd be a horrible manager, right? I can't plan. I can't organize. I can't schedule. I can't budget. I None of that. Like that, that's not for me, right? <laughs> so, but, you know, you, you, so that, it's still a, a, a needed skill set. 
Absolutely. But people have stereotyped. It is true. They've got into the whole like, all right, I'm just going to be the boss, not the leader. And it really creates a horrible environment. But if you don't train people to do it, you're short staff, you're short selling them. And also, if you got to give them opportunities to be able to, I feel, practice it. I mean, if you teach someone to do it and then you never give them a chance to practice and then all of a sudden you throw them in the deep end of the pool, mm-hmm. you haven't done them any good either. And that, well, we gave them the training. I don't understand why. <laughs> why they're not performing because they never got a chance to practice it beforehand. That's right. That's right. Just a, just a thought. I mean, it's funny. Years ago, I um, joined the fire department and had no intentions of ever joining the fire department, but I was working as a medic in this one city and fire department was trying to take over. And I was like, I don't want to be without a job. I had this horrible, horrible addiction that I'm ashamed of, right? I got totally, totally addicted to uh, a roof over my head and three squares a day, right? It was like crack. I couldn't give it up no matter what I did. It was just this awful addiction, right? So I'm like, I'm pretty keen on this like dry place to, you know, roof over the head, three squares thing. So I bailed and went over there and it was like, I was like, I, there's no way. I have no, no desire to run a burning building, but I do have a desire to pay the bills, right? So, mm-hmm. I, and, and I like working here in the people. So whatever. It's funny, but about halfway through rookie school, point being, you train someone to do the job and don't let them actually do it. But halfway through rookie school, we're like, okay, we don't go to a burn building or a training facility or somewhere where we can put these skills that you've been teaching us to use. We're going to burn this building down and practice right. putting it out, right? You <laughs> exactly. were saying, like, we want to get and actually do some of this stuff that you keep telling us about. And that's no different than managers and leaders. You you got to train them. But the problem is, half the time, they don't even get the training part. They just get thrown in and, hey, figure out, go put the fire out. And we're going to give you a suit or some water or nothing. Just, just figure it out. Yeah, but there's, but there's many of those things they can do uh, before they ever get to leadership as well. So that's that's the thing. It's called delegate. Yes, and what it does is you, the way I frame it in a couple of my presentations is, is you're building depth on the bench. You know, I, I love the guys and gals that are so micromanagey. That's probably not a word, but it sounded good. It is now. It is now. <laughs> they had to throw more like if I teach you how to do my job then you're going to take my job and I'm going to be out of a job. The funny part about that is is when it bites them in the butt, when that director who will not train some of his managers or her managers to take his position or her position, then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, this VP job comes up that, oh my God, I've always wanted. I'd love to promote you, but you don't have anybody that can take your spot and you're critical in the organization. So we're going to have to look at somebody else to take this VP spot. That's right. That's exactly right. Happens all the time. (laughs) Uh, It does. But if you have depth on the bench, you can grow, expand, scale because you've got leaders that you can, and it does, you you said it, you've got to delegate. You train them and then you delegate certain tasks and let them fail. I mean, if they screw up, you don't give them something that's going to bankrupt the company, but (laughs) something that they can practice using these skills. So when they get to that spot, it's not they, second they're pretty nature. comfortable. Yeah, it's right. second nature at that point. Right. They can take it over and, and and be good to go. So that's funny about um, kind of getting into that. But it's when you talk about uh, dialing in that job. The other part is when you have you matching people for the job. It's when you have a lot of churn and a lot of turnover in these frontline positions. And mm. yeah, that's <laughs> not good. It's expensive. And it's demoralizing. The morale goes right down the t- right down the tubes. Yes. Yep. Well, I laugh if you look at it from a behavioral point of view. Um, I pick on a buddy of mine that that runs a manufacturing plant here. I said, "Well, you can't take a whole bunch of people that are high eyes. You know, people, people, right? I've always got to be around people, and everybody's my best friend. I just haven't met them yet. You know, those kind of people that just have to be around people and hire them in for 20, 25, 30 bucks an hour." In a manufacturing plant, putting plastic bottles into a paper, uh, cardboard box Not with no human, <laughs> with no human interaction, right? No. Give them three weeks, and either they're going to get written up for being at the water fountain way too often, or B, uh, they're going to be like, "I'm out, boss. I got to go." Right. And exactly. then they're gone, and then you wonder, well, why do we have all this turnover? Because you're not putting the people with the right, right. behaviors and right. skills and temperaments into the that match the job that you're asking yeah. them to do. You're not doing the work ahead of time. Shock. Do I have a pulse? Do I have a <laughs> do I follow the mirror? You're hired. You're right. Enough of that. 
<laughs> well, and it's funny. I maybe talk about it for a second. Coming from an HR background, how many times do we dis we put negative incentives? Okay, so we incentivize the HR people that you need butts and seats. You need to hire people. You're on recruitment. You need to recruit. Hire people. Yeah, but people should be recruiting all the time, which they don't do. Right, they but then the, the turnover. Right, but you're not. But you're saying if you don't get a volume of people. But you're not incentivizing getting the right people. Yeah, right. Exactly. You you get what you reward. But the thing is, if you if you do this continually, and like you say, build that bench, you're going to have a lot internally, but you're also going to be able to do the work ahead of time that you need to do when everybody's recruiting. They say, oh, I know the perfect person. So they don't get in a bind and they can bring somebody in rather quickly that way. Right. And so when it comes down to you know, you might, if you do something, you were talking about using assessments in your business, if you use some kind of assessment based uh, to kind of match the right people to the right job, you may find fewer people to, fewer butts to put in the seats, but they're the right butts to put in the seats. That's right. And so that way, they, and it's far less turnover. Yeah, you might be slower to hire, but they're going to, they're more likely to go into stay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in the long run, so as I say, if you look at the big picture long run, you're better off saying, hey, here are the right tools you need, Mr. and Ms. HR person, to get the right people that we need so they'll stay versus, you know, the, the rewards for them, and they're going to do what's rewarded, you know, is, is higher the volume of people we need. Problem is with the turnover, you end up as expensive as it is, as you mentioned, that's really tough. Yeah. Really that's tough to keep paying. Yeah. Um, so, I did uh, another question for this particular segment. Uh, what does leadership mean to you? And, and more importantly, what does good leadership look like? Leadership is guiding people to me and helping them develop to their fullest. And a good leader has it, not hmm. IT, but EIT. They have empathy, they have integrity, and they have transparency. I like it. Yes. They have it. Yes. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. I like it. At first, we said not IT. I'm thinking, okay, what well, they don't have computer skills or what? what you know? <laughs> I mean, they can't, they can't read their email, but <laughs> uh, empathy, transparency, and integrity. Right, right, exactly. I like it. I like it. I like it. Oh, that is no, that is cool. So, um, you also can steal like, that day. I will. I probably will. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, give credit, right? I mean, you, you right. learn in you learn in a PhD program. We got to cite your sources, right? <laughs> That's uh, right. But um, what, one of the things you talk about lead is, uh, is, is kind of showing people, you know, and what I, the thing that I picked up out of what you just said, it's almost the leadership being almost like a, um, a tour guide versus a travel agent. Right. <laughs> or, or a Sherpa maybe, because, you know, it's like John Maxwell says, if, if, you're, if you're going up the mountain and there's nobody following you, you're not you're just going for a hike. Yeah, you're just going for a walk. Yeah. <laughs> you're not guiding anyone but the, the just as you said earlier helping people develop all the time that's what a good leader does a good leader can't be jealous they can't uh, deny people getting ahead that is not leadership that is not integrity at all so no. to to your point uh, you've got to be able to be willing to develop others and let them shine Give Absolutely. them the credit, yes. Well, that's why I laugh about the whole kind of manager leader thing. I kind of look at it, if you're going to break it up into the manager bad, leader good, you know, kind of dichotomy, you know, <laughs> and, and take the skill set part out of it, you you could you could probably make a good case that the, the manager is more like the travel agent, right? You go to AAA when AAA was a thing, get your trip tick, you know, and they'll say, hey, go here, go here, go here, handy the stuff, have a nice trip, right? See you later, bye. <laughs> you know, go forth and have fun versus right. the, the tour guide is kind of like, all right, come on, guys, let me take you with you. Like you said, the Sherpa, let me show you around town. Let me right. be there with you. And we're going together versus, like I said, here's your trip tick. And all right, let you know, me tell and, you the real story about this place and its history. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. No, I, I like that much more from a leadership perspective. That to me is more the leader than um, the, hey, go do whatever. And by the way, um, Make sure it's slow down when you get to this place. It's a food trap. <laughs> that was a, what was one of the biggest leadership challenges that you've ever had to face? Well, one year I said yes to being the president of our local National Speakers Association chapter. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know how much work that can be. Not as sorry as they were. Okay? Oh, no. <laughs> Detail. Uh, 
um, at the time I was finishing up my master's and I was supposed to have been finished the, before I took on this position, but the mm. university decided to postpone it. So I'm finishing up my master's during my presidential <laughs> tenure. Some people that were going to support me decided that they were going to go off and do other things, nothing to do with our relationship. They just had something else they needed to do. And um, the, of course, the chapter was in a state of flux. Thank goodness the president-elect step, stepped up and, and saved the day. So we got through the year, but it was a tough year. It was a tough year. I can understand. I was recently on the board for our local chapter. And uh, like I said, sometimes it's like you said with the masters, life happens. And um, you realize if, if depending on your particular behavior style, drivers, stuff like that. Sometimes uh, it's a few of us can take on too much too fast. And uh, when life happens, it's kind of like, okay, it's time to dial this back a little bit, you know? Right. And um, so a few, same thing, a few things come up and, um, and also let's say the time commitment too. You know, sometimes sure. you don't think it's going to be as much as a time commitment as it does. So that's, that does face some challenges. So great that you had a, a president elect that was able to uh, kind of step up and. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everything changed uh, that I had in place. I thought this is going to be a lot easier with what I had in place and what was going on, but change happens. <laughs> yes, it does. And um, well, it's funny because you end up just like, and that's a great example for a lot of leaders that do um, their ambitions and do take on too much, mm -hmm. too quick, and, and not really realize it or not trying to do that. But I've seen some that do really well. They're like, hey, you ask for like a board spot. Fine, I can be on your board, but I can give you my one hour a month or whatever. Mm -hmm. And beyond that one hour a month, that's it. But at least they're honest enough to tell you. Sometimes, um, they're, oh, it's not going to be anything, just a one hour a month, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And then kind of they sell you on, it's not going to be bad. <laughs> and this is huge commitment, right? That's and right. Then, right. And so, I mean, it's, it's a lot of different levels when you talk about that kind of stuff. But, uh, and then, like you said, sometimes you get in and based on the circumstances, that were in place, the conditions on the ground, so to speak, when I took the position. Right. You know, yeah. then when things change, now it's it's different. Everyone has to be realistic and really take a hard look and a realistic look at what they're trying to, to do in the future, you know, six months out, 12 months out, and see what is going to fit with that schedule and what is not. And you've got to prioritize because you know, while some things might look great on your bio or resume, as it may be, uh, shooting yourself in the foot, as you say, is not a good thing to do. And that doesn't look no. so great. That's just messy. No. Yes. Yes, it is quite <laughs> and, and painful. Um, yes. But the worst part, I mean, honestly, is if they ever went back and talked to somebody and they did a poor job, you know, it, it's and it is it's tough to it's humbling to say, hey, I've I said I was going to be able to do this, but I can't now. Mm, you know that yeah. that is a tough one. But you know what? Sometimes it's better to do that. Or I, I first time I ever ran into this, I was doing a strategic plan for uh, a chamber, and I was interviewing all the board members. And I had and one of the things the staff was really big on was really wanting to encourage the board members to get more involved in, in committees and, and taking on things and doing stuff, which was kind of part of the role. And I, when I said I got to one particular one, and she's like, no. I'm like, I didn't see it just a blatant, that ain't happening. And I'm like, but it, when she explained to me just what we said, that her deal was I told them when I started. She's like, I work on 100% commission. I eat what I kill. Okay, <laughs> I can't spend an inordinate amount of time. You've got my 100% dedicated expertise, attention, skill set, everything for that one hour, two hours, whatever a month that we're at the meeting. And then you know, there's occasionally some special occasion stuff that we go to and attend. Hey, that's fine. But I can't commit to doing all the other stuff. And I told you, I told them ahead of time. That was the big thing. It's like, and that was fine with them. And I'm like, I can at least respect that because I've seen way too many people overcommit and say, oh, well, yeah, I'll do this. And I'm going to be involved and I'm going to. That's the transparency though, Dave. That is the transparency. And I like that a lot. And it, like I said, it was, brutal transparency at first and i was like that's kind of harsh and then the more i thought about it no that's actually probably the best thing that you could have ever done is yeah. versus a uh, same board same everything a guy that's all involved and all in it and whatever and then all of a sudden he's just 
gone. Right. Quit yeah. everything. And he that just because it had just gotten way over his head, way too much, and just had to bail. And I'm like, if I think if he'd have been that authentically transparent beforehand and said, I can only go up to here. Right. Yeah. yeah. He wouldn't have got totally burnt out and he wouldn't have had to leave. Yeah. I was on a board recently and they had you know, changed their direction and a lot of other things had changed. And I was just becoming like a bump on a log. And I realized that I said, Hey, it's better you give this seat to somebody else. Now, sometimes that takes courage, just like you said, you know, you can't, you can't be dishonest with people and expect good results, <laughs> regardless of the circumstances. So I just, you know, I resigned from the board and we're, we're still friends and all that good stuff. It just, it was, the changes that uh, really didn't suit what I had gone in there for. So, I completely understand. And like I said, especially when you're talking about the the whole thing with your masters. Like I said, you were certainly not expecting. You thinking if that's going to be over beforehand? I'll have plenty of time. And when it's not, you're like, oh no, I yeah. would have never signed up for this if I'd have thought by any right. stretch of the imagination. Right? Who would think a school would do that, though? I mean, you know. God only knows. I mean, stranger things have happened, but uh, I mean, schools can say, "Hey, don't show up for two years," and because there's the black plague rolled into town. I mean, <laughs> of course, they're out of business now too. So, hmm. whoops, interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it's no, it, it's tough. Like I said, even the last couple of years with the, everything with the COVID. I mean, it, you talk about having to um, transition, change, challenges. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It's that's definitely been a um, a lot of hangover from that, and will continue to be. There are yes. still people that don't want to come back to work, and uh, uh, managers are having to deal with that uh, with with uh, individuals, and um, they have to learn how to deal with it. Find out the real reason they don't want to come back to work, and and uh, help people get beyond that, or either have a policy or learn to work with it. Or, tr- or change their attitude. Sometimes people just have the idea you need to be in the office, but sometimes you don't need to be in the office. So all of those things have to be taken into consideration and it just got slammed in our face so quickly. We Absolutely. weren't expecting it. So, but some, you know, now you need to take the time because you have the time now and sit down and formulate some talk, some conversation around this issue. Now, I think that a lot of employers need to be a lot more strategic on how they do things. And like I said, it's uh, I, I, two pretty good examples. I have one, a, a friend of mine that works out in the Northern Virginia area. So it's about an hour and a half, two hours away, maybe an hour and a half away. Of course, during the pandemic, everything was remote, right, for most of the staff. And it was a big bullpen type, um, cubicle type of thing. Well, things were getting done and life was good and whatever. Well, the manager, she could not stand the fact that they weren't in the building. So the first time that she had the opportunity, spent tens of thousands of dollars, and I'm probably being extraordinarily conservative with the amount of money, took all the cubicles out, brought in all these new cubicles that were individual cubicles so they could keep them three feet away. Mm. They were now COVID-safe cubicles. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe they had... Reverse osmosis filtration. On. I don't know. Some charcoal filters above them. I, I don't know. So all I know. No is, breathing in the building. Right. No. Yeah. yeah you were prohibited to breathe in the building, right? But it was. However, they ended up doing it. It ended up being tens and tens of thousands of dollars to bring in these new cubicles, so they could justify bringing everybody back into the office. Wow. I'm like, man, you've got a bad case of micromanagementitis if you've got to spend that kind of money just so you could see the people when you've been and a lot of folks on the other end are like i don't like you said i don't want to go back Mm -hmm. i have a friend of mine who's same thing out here in the the winchester area uh, office in fairfax that are you know hour and a half away or so and she's in sales and her territory is out here (laughs) so it's like why would i want to fight that dc northern virginia traffic to go in to go into an office when my sales territory is out here anyway, and I've been selling out here for the last few years, I'm like, and then I, you realize I get there like, I don't like these people. Uh, like, I don't want to be around them. <laughs> and, and, and one thing that kind of leads into is a presentation I'd done, and we were actually uh, doing like a workforce coalition type of meeting this morning with some chamber members in a different location. 
and I was sharing some Gallup data. And Gallup from their State of the Workforce 2021, which is the latest one that they have, talked about the, the great resignation. And like, it wasn't an, a workplace. It wasn't a industry issue, a pay issue, or a skill issue. It was a, uh, or a role issue. It was a workplace issue. Interesting. They were, yeah. it's because people coming back, they're like, do I really want to go back and work for that crappy manager in a horrible culture and a bad environment for what? And then if you look at it, if it's a you know two parent uh, two uh, income household, especially with young kids, do I would do I really want to pay if I've got two kids? So I really want to pay the cost for childcare. What is my true net that I'm making with the hassle, with the headache, the commute, the childcare, the this, the that, and the other? What am I really netting? To go back to a crappy environment with the boss I don't want to be around. <laughs> That's right. Is it worth mm. that? No. <laughs> Is it yeah. really worth it? No. Guess what? I can take my graphic design skills and put them on Fiverr or artwork or something. Mm -hmm. And for that little bit of net between what I'm paying in gasoline and commuting costs and, and childcare, daycare, right. for that little bit difference between that and my salary, I could make three times that on Upwork or Fiverr or so, or, you know, or on some kind of, you know, per gate, you know, my own thing and stay home yeah, and have more time. Like, why would I want to do that? So, I mean, and that's a lot of, that's a lot of it. Yeah. It's not all of it because when we were talking today, you could have the best workplace culture in the world. And if people apply and actually show up for the interview and actually accept the job, there's a lot of assumptions there. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just say they do. And they don't even show up for the job, right? It's like, they don't, they don't even there long enough to know if you have a great workplace culture or not. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you still right. got that. You still got that. <laughs> right. But there's a lot of, you're right, there's a lot of people that just like, I, mm -mm, I, I ain't doing it. Yeah, um, right. So, and, and some of it can be generational too, because we had a, a gentleman from our small business development center come in. And did a lot of research on this and come to find out it was like uh, he was giving some example of his kid and his girlfriend he was like you know that the gen z generation said they don't spend money like we do mm. he's like give you an example he said my son and his girlfriend and they go to travel most of the time if we go to travel what are we gonna, where are we going to stay Begins with the H, ends in, uh, you know, uh, ends in hotel, right? <laughs> so we're probably going to stay in a hotel. Right? We're going to spend money to stay in a hotel. They're, half the time, they're like, hey, we're just taking the Subaru. We're going across country. And, you know, half the time, we're probably just going to you know, lay the seats down, roll up the sleeping bags, and we'll just hang out there, you know? And so, yeah, they, and they just are not spending the money. So, like, they don't need the money to spend the money. And for them, it's more important to just enjoy life. <laughs> Nice, I guess, you know. I guess. These I are know. <laughs> although my sixty thousand dollar crappy comment of the day. Ding, 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 okay, winner. Um, my sixty thousand dollar crappy comment of the day is a lot easier to enjoy life when you can stay on your parents' health insurance until twenty six yeah. and not be in college. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> right. Just saying. <laughs> just just saying it does make it easier than ooh, I get kicked off at eighteen if I'm not a full time student. I best go find a J O B. Yeah. It has See, insurance. Well, when, I, when I left home, you didn't go back. That was it. You sank or swam, you know. <laughs> None of that. <laughs> no, you no, no. I the few people I did know that ended up going back, it was more of those they worked a lot of part time. And in the fire department worked a whole lot of part time and then basically had kids and then basically they ended up getting divorced and wife, husband, whoever took them for everything. And basically when they're taking 100% of your full-time paycheck in alimony, child support, whatever, at that point, you're kind of like, you know, I probably need to, yeah, that's, that's the, let me go back to mom and dad's at 30 something, not because I failed to thrive because uh, I need a place to kind of recoup and repair. Like, I just took a big smack in the face. Right. Um, right. I don't want to be on the street. That's for sure. I don't want right. I don't want to be on the street. So uh, I will say the couch of the basement is better than the street, but some yeah. circumstances, let's just say, are different than others. But yeah. that was it was that extreme case, right. not the I just really like it down here, and the video games are great, and the, yeah. the laundry yeah. service still works. So I'm. Uh, <laughs> I got close. But, <laughs> I got close, but I made it. <laughs> yes. Hey, well, I think have, have we all? And I want to ask yeah. you, Diane, what do you think is the best way for leaders to improve their leadership skills? 
Mm. When, you know, when somebody inherits a team, and I don't care if they've been on the team and they've suddenly become the leader, they need to talk to their team as a unit, but they also need to talk to every individual member of that team. They need to learn the history of the team. They need to, to the first words out of their mouth when they talk to the team as a unit is, I don't have all the answers. I'm gonna rely on you for some. I'm gonna help you with the things that you might not understand, but together we'll have each other's backs. When they talk to the individual people, they need to understand that person's goals, their talents, their behavioral styles, their communication styles, because you cannot lead people if you don't understand people. And that is something that every leader needs to do. Somebody needs to write that down. You cannot lead people if you don't understand people, right? <laughs> hmm. That is, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I laugh, I'm like, you know, to tell them as a team, like, I don't have all the answers. And I'm like, you mean it's not like divine right of kings? You know, I mean, you're not imparted by all wisdom from from God just because they, you got a new a title on the organizational chart? Doesn't work that way. Oh, Sorry. I got a new title and a five percent raise, and uh, and now, and I, work now 30, I know everything. Right. Now I work thirty hours a week more than I did before, and uh, most of that for free, and uh, <laughs> and now I know everything. Right. Yeah, not so much, huh? Yeah, right. Not so much is right. Yes. Um, when, the, when you do these things, you can work better as a unit. And you know, helping team members build their careers helps you build a better team because they're more engaged, they get what they want, the organization gets a better employee. It's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. If an organization does not have a career path, I think they're making a big mistake. It's funny you mentioned that because some of the research I did for like I said, the presentation I was telling you about where I pulled the Gallup information for the, the Great Resignation, there was some other statistical data that came through that talked about internal mobility in organizations. Mm -hmm. We're talking about retention. And I didn't realize it was this drastic. But right? You kind of anecdotally know, but until you see some data, you're like, hmm, interesting. Most organizations that they had studied that had low internal mobility, the average tenure was about 2.9 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, whatever, respectable. I'll get about three years there, and then they go do several ways. But for organizations that had high internal mobility, and that doesn't mean like upward necessarily. That's yeah. I can just I can lateral wherever and right. have some mobility in the organization. It uh, the average tenure was five point four years. Mm, exactly. So we're talking about almost right. double just because you can not necessarily have a career path up, but you have ways to move around the organization to try okay. different things and and are mobile. That's yeah. That's significant when it comes to turnover. Right. That career path, Dave, goes back to what you were talking about earlier about giving people the opportunity to learn things and try them out. Mm -hmm. That is part of that process. They get to job shadow. They network. All of those things make a big, big difference in a person's career path and the way they serve the organization. Well, and I think if you stay in an organization, some of it could be organization-led and driven, and some could be personal driven. Absolutely. But, I, but I'll give you a perfect example of something that typically happens in a, let's just say not known for being the most progressive organizations in the world, right? So I've come, from, like I say, come from the fire service, you know, they took about 200 years of tradition, totally unimpeded by progress, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> that's kind of the motto, right? Okay. And so uh, he's just like, can't, can't seem to figure this out. But what they do do is say you come up you know, in the ranks and you be, you know, maybe from a, a firefighter or master firefighter, whatever, lieutenant, captain, and become a battalion chief. So now you're putting out the fire by driving around in a suburban and shouting stuff on a radio, right? I mean, so, <laughs> you know, it's a pretty unique skill putting out a fire with a radio, right? Instead of water, right? But, but you know, work with me, but you're still on the 24 hour shifts, you're in the command vehicles and stuff like that. But at some point, if you want to break that barrier and maybe go to, a deputy chief or a chief of a department, you've got the operational stuff down. But most of the time, they'll take those people and they'll say, okay, now we're going to rotate you. You're going to do two years in training. You're going to do two years in fire prevention. You're going to do two years in admin. You're gonna, and they start rotating them around to the different positions. And when they do, and a lot of times it's like, I don't want to. Like, we don't care what you want, right? We're just telling you, you're going to rotate. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if you want to keep that paycheck coming in that retirement, 
you know, uh, add years to the pension, you probably are going to take the reassignment we're going to give you, right? Right. But what it does is it allows them, so they, they can touch all the different parts of the organization and get a good solid understanding of it. So when they do go up to the assistant chief or deputy chief or something like that, or, you know, eventually the chief somewhere, it's not just I'm good at the operational and but I don't know much about any of the other parts of the organization. So taking that same kind of model, if you can as either an organization have people where they can do rotate around and maybe that is part of the career path. Hey, you oh, sure. couple years over here, a couple years over here, a couple years over here, or as an ambitious I want to move up in the organization. I'm really good at what I'm doing, maybe marketing or whatever. Maybe I need to get into operations a little bit. Maybe I need to get into research. Maybe I need to get into sales and, and hit some of these elements. So you, one, it's different and it's a challenge and you learn new skills, but it also makes you a little bit more well-rounded. So maybe that does enhance your ability to move up later down right. the line. Right. And understanding other people's jobs is a real plus because then you can better do strategy that way. So it's really important. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's you know, whether it's, uh, and having the ability of an organization for people to say, yes, you can move from this department to that department is kind of the high internal mobility that they were talking about, and right. people will stay longer. And we talk about how turnover is extraordinarily expensive. The bad part about it is you're never going to have a CFO. You're never going to have one of your finance or your CPAs uh, have that on a line item on your P&L statement or your balance sheet. <laughs> cost of turnover, cost of disengagement. It's not on there. It's a, it's a, it's a cost. When people it's leave and walk out the door, it's expensive. It but, at, but that cost is not part of gap accounting measures, right? right. And it's not something you're going to get as a leader on a P&L. Like, right. Oh my God, look at how much our line item for turnover is this year. Good Lord, we need to do something. But it's got to be in there. It's got to be in there because it, it just eats your bottom line alive. Oh, it, it's it's not part of the gap accounting procedures. It's not something that you're going to get in a standard right, financial right. report, but it's a real hard cost. It and so hard sometimes cost. people hear training and development, organizational development, HR, whatever, you know, a lot of people think very driven, very task oriented. People think of warm and fuzzy. Like we're not paying for warm and fuzzy. What <laughs> they don't realize is there's a hard cost that comes with warm and fuzzy, right? That's right. Exactly. And yes, when you talk about employee engagement, there's a lot, there's way too much hard data, scientific data correlating the employee engagement to productivity. Right. The other People, thing is that employees need to understand that they really do need to develop themselves because a job is only worth so much to an organization. You're not going to pay an admin $125,000 a year simply because she's been there 25 years. I'm sorry. No. So it's up to the employee to take some responsibility and accountability for developing their own career as well. Just as you said a while ago, it's a two-way street. Absolutely. Because gone are most of the days. And if they are still around, it's probably in more of those military, civil service type, public safety, where it's very few jobs that, okay, well, you get a step raise every year, and then we may or may not do a cost of living adjustment, but you know, you know I can look 20 years out and I, here's my mm-hmm. path going forward, right? I'm in civil service and I'm going to go, I started as a GSA. Now I'm going to be, you know, I do this and this in a couple of years, I'll be uh, all these steps, GSA, step one, two, three, whatever, and then I can go to a nine or a 10 mm-hmm. and I can start moving up the ladder that way. Well, that doesn't happen in a lot of places. And mm-hmm. you're lucky just to get the cost of living. Right. You know, and that and and uh, your performance bonus if you're really good at what you're doing. But you're right, just because you're there 20 years. Right. Um, and the other there's also a flip side of that coin and that I talk about when I talk about generational differences in the workplace. You know, it's I will say there is something to be said when you finally hit that point in your career. When the new people coming in that are, let's just say, running them out, talking trash, whatever, you know, they, they know it all. They've been there for, uh, I call them a 220. And I'll explain what a 220 is in a second, but I call them a 220, right? But it, you realize when the new people coming in and you think to yourself, you know, I've been doing X, whatever X is at your company. I've been doing X longer than you have been physically on God's green earth. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're 21 years old and I've been doing this for 25 years or you're 21 years old or 23 years old and I've been doing this for 30 years or so on and so forth, you get this out. That ends up being a stark realization. You're like, and you know, not that you want to throw that car down every once in a while, but it is something you're like, I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. Right. But 
On the other end of it, for the say the 25 year old that is sharp at trying to bring new ideas, do you truly have 30 years of experience or do you have one year of experience that you've re- rinsed and repeated 29 additional times? <laughs> and didn't learn anything new in the process, right? <laughs> my point, I haven't developed right. my skills, I haven't gotten any better. I got one good solid year of experience and I've just rinsed and repeat 29 additional times. I still don't know how to send an email, but you know. <laughs> But I can run, I, I can pull this level on this production line like a champ. <laughs> it's, something, it's something to think about. Yes, it is. It really is. So, um, I mean, that's one of those things that, you know, encouraging people to develop skills. But I, I laugh because one of the things that when you look at from an HR and a training and development standpoint, I would like to get your, your thoughts on this. Um, I always talk to people about mentorship programs. And people are thinking, okay, I'm going to take my experienced person and put it with my new person. And Okay. Yes, and a reverse mentor program. And, and what I say is you've got the folks that are your 220s, right? And, and, and this is the negative connotation, not the positive I'm getting ready to talk about. I call somebody a 220 if they've been there two days, two months, two weeks, two years, act like they've been there for 20. <laughs> right? They get that old, salty, jaded, like a rat this place. Rat, 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 rat. You know, it's like, look. The person's been here for 20 years all salty and jaded, probably for a good reason that doesn't apply to you, right? Okay, you haven't been through some of the trials, tribulations, right. pooped upon, whatever you want to call right. it, like that right. maybe they have in the last 20 years, right? Exactly. And you just you don't have the experience level to kind of you know uh, support the bravado that you're coming to the table with. And I get it, they see the people that have been there 20, 25 years. Mm-hmm. They see the respect they get in the workplace because they've been there that long. And I understand that you would want that and want to strive for that type of thing. Yeah. And so it's easy to, to kind of act like that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. But you know, your attitude, your mouth, your hind parts, whatever, are writing checks that your <laughs> skill level cannot cash. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and your experience level cannot cash, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, but, what, but you can take some of that ambition and I call it a reverse mentor program. You take people that are great with technology. Mm-hmm. Right, these kids coming out, the, the young people coming in, they're really, really, really good with technology. And same thing, you pair them with somebody who's you know, maybe not as good with technology, who's been there for a while. They one, they share their experience about, hey, here's where the bodies are buried, right? Here's where the skeletons are in the closet, right? But on the other hand, you know, they're like, hey, look, that you know, there's a quicker way to do that, right? And they can just mm-hmm. honestly even stand there and just watch them do some of their tech work. And realize, you know, you could do this and this would make it easier. And you, I mean, they could help up with the technology end of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so they're really contributing and, and doing something that they know much better than the person that they're helping who's been there longer. And then vice versa, they kind of get that reciprocal. So it, it, it's, it's a nice positive way to have somebody who's young be able to feel like that they're able to contribute to people that have been there a long time, something that is really helpful for them. Yeah. It's, everybody wins when you do that. And um, I see companies now more and more are hiring coaches. They have internal coaches and external coaches. And of course, there's a coach on every corner, but everybody needs help. Coaches have coaches. So the mentoring, uh, the coaching, whatever works for an individual and whether they work better with an internal coach or an external coach, it needs to be a good fit. So I encourage companies to continue working on that and, and building that into their um, their organization and have a culture of coaching. Absolutely. And that's one of those things that sometimes the external works better than the internal because, oh, I know the internal one. Do mm-hmm. I really want to air my dirty laundry to somebody who's quote unquote in HR, you know, who, <laughs> you know, go down that road, right? <laughs> but yeah, it can be versus I'm talking to somebody from the outside that, I don't know them necessarily, but I mean, you build the rat relationship as you go through that process, but it's not somebody who's, you know, uh, you, you have that particular concern about, uh, or, you know, it's just something that's different talking to somebody from the outside. And sometimes it's better talking to somebody from the inside because they know the dynamics of the organization. Yeah. When, you, when you make an innuendo or an insinuation or something like that, they, they get the comment that you're you right. don't have to fill them in on the details. Yeah, but, maybe uh, maybe the, the perfect fit is an in, internal mentor and an external coach. How's that? Not a bad, not a bad way to go because they are different things. Yes, Absolutely. And I, and I really do think um, depending on how you look at it, just a good way to 
a good analogy, right? If you, you can just take it from a, a, it doesn't have to be religious, but I'm going to use a religious analogy. You know, everyone are like, okay, um, everybody should, you know, find a Paul and find, and, and look for a Peter. You know, the, you know it's, it's like, or I mean, look for a Timothy, right? I, I look for someone who's going to mentor me, mm-hmm. right? And you always look for a mentor, no matter how long you've been doing it. Who somebody's always been doing it longer, always got a better skill set. So can sure. I look at? Can I find somebody who can mentor me? Mm-hmm. And also, who can I? pass the information down to you mentioned maxwell before it's kind of like he talks about being a river not a reservoir right yeah. i've got a, a, you coming in because i'm being mentored by people that have a lot more skills and experience than i do and i'm also passing that on to somebody else and so it keeps the the flow of information fresh versus i got what i got and i yeah. just kind of hoard it on myself and i might be taking in but if i'm not giving to anybody yeah I, I'm overflowing, but I'm not being able to do anything with it. If I'm constantly giving and I'm not getting, then you, your well is going to run dry pretty quick. Yeah, that's right. Or you're not giving, or you're not giving, and you're just a stagnant, algae-filled right. pool of <laughs> man, whatever. That's right. <laughs> and, and none of it's good. None, none of that is good. good. No. None of that is good. So, in the last minute or so, tell our listeners how they can get connected with you. Uh, they can call me at 404-320-7834. They can go to my website at performstrat.com or they can email me at diane at dianebogino.com. That sounds great. Well, I tell you what, uh, I took it to have you on the program and we will be back next time with Conversations on Leadership with Dr. Dave here on KLDR online leadership development radio and i would absolutely encourage everybody to reach out to diane um check out some of our services and one more time diane before we go what was the website so they can go and see you know all the goodness of uh you know the, the bogino empire <laughs> they can go to uh performstrat.com it's short yes. for performance strategies and you know dave i also have a youtube channel called build a better career so if people want to go on there and get career tips they can do that also organizations can call me for um a webinar on demand on strategic thinking very nice it's always a good thing to uh, kind of try before you buy a little introduction to uh introduction to the performance strategy so thanks again diane and we will talk soon take care Thank we'll you. see you next time on Conversations on Leadership with Dr. Dave here on KLDR Online Leadership Development Radio.